Hello everybody, I'm Nick and this time I'm going to show you how you can rate limit or throttle your API in ASP.NET Core. If you're making a public API or even if you're making a private API and you're selling access to this API, you might want to limit how much a user can call that API in a time frame. That might be a minute, a day, a month. And you can sell that sort of rate limiting as credits for the user. So in a bigger plan, you might be able to call the API more times. It's something you must have seen if you're using basically any API and usually you have to code your way around that feature. Now, ASP.NET Core doesn't natively support this feature, but there is a new Git packet that can enable you to do that very, very easily. And another problem is if you're scaling out your application and you're not managing the state inside a single instance of your application, then that becomes tricky. I'm going to show you how you can solve that as well. If you like the type of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe and the notification bell to get alerted when I upload a new video. So what do I have here? Well, I have this simple API with a simple weather forecast controller, and I'm going to use this as a base to implement my rate limiting or throttling. And if I run it and I just call it, you can see that it's just your usual weather API and I can keep spamming it. Now, let's say I want to limit per IP how many times this can be called. Let's say you can only call it twice in a 15 second time frame. Usually they're bigger, but just so I don't make this video 30 minutes long, I'm going to use shorter time frames here. Well, it is actually surprisingly easy. If you go on NuGet, you can search for ASP.NET Core Rate Limit and you'll see this NuGet package here and you can just install it. And now we can start implementing our rate limiting. Now, first you need to implement the app settings. I'm going to paste those and talk you through each one of them rather than build it individually because it will be time consuming and I'm not going to go through every single setting in this video. I'm going to link the project down below, give it a star. It's a decent project with a few bugs, but most certainly for what you might use it in a very basic scenario, it will do miracles. Now we have the settings here and these are the IP rate limiting settings. It supports two types of rate limiting. IP based, so based on your IP, or client based. And client is associated with a unique identifier which you are ultimately rate limiting. Client ID can be used, as you can see, on the IP rate limiting as well, but it's mostly used for whitelisting rather than limiting itself. And you can also have IP whitelist as well. I'm going to explain all that once we run through the basic boilerplate setup in startup.cs. So first we need to say add options here and this will allow us to register the options and then services.add memory cache because this will use the in-memory cache to store the state. And then we need to configure the options that we have here, the IP rate limiting and the IP rate limit policies. Those will be used by the package to determine whether it should throttle you or not. We're going to paste this here, but ultimately this is a simple dot configure on the object and then point to the section in the app settings. Then we need to specify that we want to add in memory rate limiting and this will use the memory cache registered here. And in the end, we need to do a services dot add singleton I rate limit configuration comma rate limit configuration. And that's it. Now we have rate limiting. If I go to the app dot settings, that's to show you that it's working. As you can see, my general rules here say that for any endpoint, in a period of 15 seconds, limited by two requests. And since this is an IP rate limit, it will limit it on an IP basis. The last thing I need before I run this is all the way down here, I need to add in the configure method an app dot use IP rate limiting, since we are using IP rate limiting here. By the way, for the avoidance of doubt, I am individually showing those features, but you could mix and match IP rate limiting and client rate limiting. This is not a showstopper. It just means more configuration for you. So if I execute this now and I go back into Postman and I use this, now you can see we have a few more headers here. And let me just show you what they are. You have the X rate limit limit, X rate limit remaining, X rate limit reset. So now, the server, as we're calling those endpoints, tells us what's the limit on that specific endpoint. So in 15 seconds is the limit. I have one request remaining, and then it tells me when the thing resets. So in 15 seconds, I can actually call it again and have my credits back. And it's very easy if you just think about it in a credit-based system, in a token-based system. So if I call it again, because 15 minutes passed, they reset. If I call it again, now I run out of um, requests. So if I call it again, it says API quota exceeded, maximum admitted two per 15 seconds. So I'm getting a 429, which is the too many requests. So appropriate status code, a message saying what happened and 
in the headers it says retrying after seven and those are seconds so retry after seven seconds and then you'll be allowed let's take a look at the settings first before i go into the client based user limiting which is a bit more interesting in my opinion so first you have enable endpoint rate limiting so if you enable this to true then you will be able to specify specific endpoints that you want to rate limit uh, here so for example a GET request on the API license endpoint has its own rule and then you can create a list of rules for each endpoint if you want so individual endpoints can have different levels of rate limit in our test it's global so I don't need to change this stack block requests means that when I'm calling here and I'm getting rate limit at some point if I turn this into true then it will keep adding my failed attempts into the data store that it's remembering how many times I failed and this can be particularly interesting because you could for the same endpoint here if I change that have different periods of time so I can say that in a one minute um, period have a limit of five requests so and let me just change this to uh, five here so in five seconds two requests in one minute five and I'm going to show you why that's important let me just reset that real quick so we have again two rules on the exact same endpoint technically if i go here and call i'm allowed one two in five seconds exceeded but if i keep calling this didn't affect the one minute time span because i was able to still keep pushing data but if i turn this into true now the failed request will stack and they will affect the next layer as well which is in a minute so two for five seconds and then i'm hitting five it says five in one minute this was not possible if i had this set to false because the blocked request would not stack in the in-memory data store so that is what this is doing now the real ip header is sometimes you're behind the reverse proxy and you're losing the real ip of the user calling your api you're going to get the ip of the proxy and everyone would look like they have the same ip so usually what proxies do is they attach the real IP in a header on the request and then you can read that uh, header and determine who's the real owner of this IP and this is the name basically of the header so what you would do or what the proxy would do is it would go here add the real IP and then add the IP here and the system would be able to read this IP from the proxy and determine whether it's throttled or not that's all there is to it now the client id header is going to be more interesting when we go to the client id but even on ip rate limiting you can actually have a specific rule for a client id and this is usually for the white listing so for example if you have a client who let's say paid for premium and you don't want to throttle them on their ip then you can specify the header that you should read the client id from and then if I enable this, and this is the dev ID one, which is a whitelisted uh, client here, then if I keep calling that endpoint, I'm not going to get throttled. You can see that I, I still have the rules all the way here, but I'm not getting throttled no matter how many times I call. That's because this client ID is whitelisted. And you can also have the same um, IP whitelisting. So if you had an IP, you want a whitelist, you can put it here and it won't get throttled now there's another interesting feature and that is the ip rate limit policies but in my experience these don't really work currently in that feature so i'm not going to show them if at some point they do work then go back to the github repo and use it the idea is that different ips could have different rules and that's it now let's say that you don't want to do it on ip because ip is very general and you want to do it on a client basis maybe because you want to sell access to a specific client and by client by the way it can mean anything you can actually get full control of that single id that you're going to limit on so if i just paste here the config settings for that and let me just talk you through that you can see that a lot of stuff actually look the same so you have endpoint whitelist client id general rules basically the same things and then the client rate limiting policies so the whole idea behind those is basically the same it just mainly removes all the ip related concerns now there is some changes we need to do in the startup as well so first we no longer need the ip settings for client rate limiting we're going to use client ones instead here we go same logic nothing special here and then this doesn't really change either and then instead of use ip rate limiting i'm going to use app dot use client rate limiting and let's see what the default behavior out of the box is so we have 10 seconds per two requests uh, rate limiting and this applies everywhere 
And if I run this now and I go back in here, I can use the X client header to get the value. And now this is a whitelisted value, if I remember correctly. So if it wasn't, if, if I change this to a zero and I keep calling, then in two requests, I will get throttled for 10 seconds. The usual throttling that we saw before. However, if this was a whitelisted client, I could keep calling it and I'm not going to get throttled. This is the basic idea. Now, you might not want to use a header for that. You might want to use your own ID. Let's say that's a client ID. That, that's anything. That's an API key. Well, you could very much change this, which is the client ID header to anything you want. So let's say you had an API key header and you want to limit by that, then you can do that. And this could be something like my key here. So if I run this again and I go and I add this header as the client ID, so remove that and say API key and I keep calling. Now I'm not getting throttled because this dev ID is still in my list. If I change that, however, to a zero, which is not, then I will get throttled. And if I use the API key, which is my key, then again, I'm whitelisted. So now my client ID is the API key header. Now, again, you might not want to do that. You might want to be more flexible. Maybe you want to use some data uh, in combination in the HTTP context and you want to make it out of that, you can do that. The first thing you need to do is, let me just make a folder, rate limiting, is create a configuration for rate limiting. So custom rate client configuration. And what we're going to do, if you see in the startup, is we have this rate limit configuration. We're going to just provide our own version of this. And we're going to do that because we want to extend how client rate limiting works. So we're going to import that, implement it, and then we're going to register that instead of the default one. And let me just copy paste this here. Now, just by registering that, we didn't actually do anything. So what you also need to do is to actually create what's called a client result contributor. So if I go here and I create a new class and I call this custom client result contributor, this should implement the I client result contributor interface and then in here is where you can use the HTTP context and get anything you want data from the request data from the user any type of data that this thing can provide the HTTP context you can use and you can rate limit on that the only thing you need to do is to actually return the string back for example here's a very basic implementation I'm getting the nick header and by the way you could get the header before without making a custom resolver but it's completely up to you to do whatever you want with the HTTP client. I'm just showing this because it's a very easy example to communicate. And what this will do is it will try to get the header and then it will get the value and then return the value and it's going to throttle you on that value. This could be anything. You could even read the body of the request, pause it and do it based on something on that body. Body dot read and you can do whatever you want. We ain't going to do that. But let me just register this. You have to go back to the configuration and you have to override the register resolvers. And then after base, what you can say is client resolvers dot add new. And you just add the contributor here and that's it. And now I can go back, execute this. And what did I call this header? Nick header. Great. So if I go here, remove this and I add Nick header one, 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 I don't know something. And I add some key then I'm rate limited on that key. So when I change this key, again, each key gets rate limited individually. Now, this is all the basic configuration you need to know about, but we have a problem. And let me show you what the problem is. Let's say that I have two instances of this API running at the same time. One is running on uh, 5001 and one is running on 5003. Now, they're both the same application, just fully stateless, but behind the load balancer. Imagine that. And if I go now with this uh, Nick header from different instances of the API, but still the same API nonetheless, then if I call this twice with that key, I can still call it from another instance and not get throttled. My throttling isn't consistent across every application that is distributed behind the load balancer for this single API. So how do we solve this? Well, thankfully, they've made it very, very easy for us. The way to do it is you have to go and add the .redis version of the package as well. And we're going to use Redis, which is a distributed NoSQL uh, key value per database to hold the state for those requests. I am already running an instance of Redis in Docker here. And if you get the source code, you can actually just use that um, to understand how it works. So once I install this package, I can go back to startup and do a couple of changes. First, I no longer need the in-memory store, but I do need the add distributed memory 
cache instead. And then instead of add in memory rate limiting, we say services dot add Redis rate limiting here. And before this, we need to configure our multiplexer for Redis. This is basically uh, what helps us make the connection to Redis and it will be used by basically this and this to make sure we can actually make the connection there. And that's it. Those three lines is the only thing you need to change. And once you do that, if I run this again and I go back in here, I have to stop this first. Let me just stop you as well. If I run the APIs again using Redis and my Redis cluster is running and you can see that there are no keys currently in Redis. If I go in Postman and call it twice, I'm rate limited here. And if I go in the other instance, I'm still rate limited because in Redis now it is storing how many times I've called it and it has a time to live, meaning in three seconds, I can actually call it again. And if I go back into Redis and I reload, it remembers that it's now one and again, time to live. So now all the instances of that API will use Redis as a data store to make sure that the limiting is consistent across any number of scaled out applications for this API. Well, there you have it. These are all the basic features to get you started solving the problem of IP rate limiting, client rate limiting, or API key rate limiting, and also how to add a distributed memory cache to make sure that all of your instances behind the load balancer are consistent with the rate limiting. That's all I have for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreon for making this videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.